Good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Chloe, thank you very much for your opening words. Uh, Nicole, there's a map of the Botanic Gardens. May we throw that up quickly for everyone to have a look at? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, forgive me, speaking to you as an audience, I can only assume you're a global audience. And to that end, I also assume that not all of you have had the fortune to visit Crookshank Botanic Garden uh, and or recent uh, visit it in recent months or years. The map you see in front of you is one that I had created by our own internal um, university uh, graphics printing house printing team when I first arrived here in 2012. There is no scale to this map, that's deliberate, but there is a key and it is considerably more constructive than the one I inherited. Today, we will be viewing the first two thirds of the Botanic Garden in total 11 acres in size. And so where you see the numbers one, two, three, four, five, and six. Uh, so moving from the map left to right, you'll see St. Maca Drive on the very far left, uh, moving across um, into the central section of six where there's three small blue bodies of water that space is where we will be uh, walking so to speak walking through the landscape for today's tour the northern end of the botanic garden number seven eight and nine that is our arboretum i will be doing another of these virtual tours in april it'll be super to have your involvement at that stage the arboretum will be highlighted at that time as well uh, nicole thank you very much let's let's start uh, the opening scene, if you could immediately pause it, I'll just say a few more words about the garden and then we'll carry on from there. Just while everyone's waiting for the opening scene to come up, <laughs> and there you go, uh, that was taken, um, what are we today, Tuesday, that was taken all of four days ago. Uh, there is a pair of phrases that I think all gardeners have ready at hand, one of them to any given audiences. It's such a shame that you're um, here today because of course last week it was looking so wonderful. Conversely, one can say it's such a shame that you're here today because of course next week it will be um, quite stunning. It so happens that virtually all of the snow that you're going to see today has now gone. We're dealing with temperatures of 10 degrees C today. The sun is out, snowdrops are visible in the beds and it really does feel like a charming uh, mid-winter's day. But I think today's tour from the scenes of four days ago is possibly a little more typical of what was once upon a time a very common winter and gardening scene here in the Northeast. So you're going to see a winter wonderland today. Uh, I should add that as curator, for those of you who aren't aware, I have the huge pleasure of curating the most northern university botanic garden in the United Kingdom. Uh, there are only 13 university botanic gardens in the UK, so this is a unique and elite resource, not just for the Northeast, but particularly, of course, for the University of Aberdeen. And I started here in 2012. I am the first curator in a quarter of a century. The university had mothballed the post for 25 years. I'm delighted to be the one who is now holding this post and helping uh, manage and progress this very wonderful and beautiful resource. Nicole, if we could start away, please. Um, what you'll find everyone as we do today's tour is that the, it'll be very much start, stop and start. If any of you have ever joined me on a tour in real time, you'll know that today's tour is very similar to my own physical tours. So we'll move through the landscape and explain a little as we go. Nicole, that's fine right there. Thank you. So um, as, uh, as we were panning a little uh, to our left there, you would have spied possibly a snowman. Uh, in all my years of being here, that is the first snowman I've seen on the property. I think it was created by some of the technicians in the Crookshank building. The building that was uh, initially in the foreground of this video is on the eastern flank of the Botanic Garden. And it is where the plant and soil science research of the university occurs. Um, in this picture, on in the very far distance, you can just make out a building, you'll see that uh, later on in the tour more formally. That is the western flank of the botanics and that's the zoology building. So how appropriate that this botanic garden should be framed by other university assets, the study of 
fauna at one end of the study of flora and soil at the other. This main paved path in front of you swings to the right. You'll see a little bit more of that in a moment and then carries on into our Botanic Garden nursery area behind the scenes, facilities for myself and staff, but it also swings off to the left, taking you straight through the heart of the Botanic, the southern heart of the Botanic Garden to the zoology building. So this paved path is deliberately, in snowy weather, deliberately um, scraped clean, salt put down, so it is a thoroughfare. Uh, shortly after this, um, after you see this path slowly move off to your right, we'll be turning left into the first southern labyrinth lawn of the botanic collection. Nicole, if we could carry on. I should add, as you're uh, looking at this scene, like I said, this was taken on Saturday. Uh, it was also strong gusts of over 40 miles per hour. So periodically you're going to see uh, the trees blowing happily uh, to the left, to the right. I can also tell you there was a, there was a relatively good wind chill when I was out taking this video. Uh, you're now looking up a pathway that was non-existent when I first arrived. Uh, I feel it's very important for the Botanic Collection to be able to be seen and enjoyed by one and all, not just under the auspices of research and learning, but for public enjoyment. And access to different areas is crucial. This seemed uh, initially when I first arrived, this was a very dense bed of vegetation. Nobody could find the pond with great ease that's in front of you there with the timber gate leading to the pond dipping platform that um, I've, I've had subsequently put in, uh, help build that. And as we move forward to that, you'll see, you'll see the pond. You'll also see that the vista opens into the labyrinth lawn. You might have spied a moment ago a holly on the right hand side there had been um, cut down quite low to the ground. Again, all part of our gradual tree management in the collection, allowing more light in, under, improving the understory vegetation and improving our gradual displays. So in a moment, we'll pivot to the left. You'll look at the frozen pond and uh, we'll just stop there for a second. Nicole, thank you very much. That's perfect. Uh, a typical winter scene, but uh, possibly atypical of recent winters here in Aberdeen. Uh, I should add that we're a mile from the ocean. For all of you who are um, uh, uh, alumni of, of uh, recent years, you'll recognize and the, the proximity to the ocean has, has always, while well, it's always had a significant warming influence in the city, uh, our mild winters are part of that. And so the scene here of the, the ice and snow in front of you is not, not typical. This pond is also very deceptive. It has three different, um, it has three different uh, uh, depths. The first is, is a mere 20 centimeters, then it drops off to about 40. And from there, it drops off to um, over a meter in depth. So when we get in there to clear out vegetation, we do so in chest waders. Uh, just beyond on the top of the screen, you can just make out another feature in the lawn. That's our so-called keyhole garden. It's a little raised bed that is an area to grow vegetables and highlight plants for edible use. The building in the background there is known as 23 St. Mac Drive, or the, the Oris building. It's presently where we have genomics research and Uniprint who produced the map you saw earlier. Well, you're looking here at a slightly obscure scene, but it is a um, rootstock of a witch elm, Ulmus glabra, Scots elm. And um, four years ago, this rootstock was grafted um, was graft based material to the sign above, producing the most wonderful and stunning 90 year old pendulous witch elm known as Almus glabra campidownii. Tragically, we have Dutch elm disease in Aberdeen, indeed Aberdeenshire, and this elm fell to, died and fell to this disease, Dutch elm disease. You'll know that it came into the UK in a very um, prevalent dominant manner down in England in the 1960s. It's taken 40 odd years to reach the Northeast here, but tragically it's, it is now killing off the native Scotch elms, including this lovely pendulous plant. However, uh, we deliberately kept the rootstock in the hope that it would break. And what I mean by that is send out water shoots. You're seeing that we'll thin those out this coming growing season. And it is my hope that we will have this as a permanent 
plant not a permanent tree or never grow back into anything formal but a per permanent living elm so that visitors can see what the growth and leaf looks like of a of a scots elm uh, chances are the timber will bulk up over 15 years producing enough wood for the beetle to return uh, not the tree back again with dutch elm but i hope we have that 15 year cycle I should add that just where Nicole has stopped it with impeccable timing on one of the branches there you can see a little what looks possibly like a leaf it happens to be a blue tag some trees in the collection have these tags on they're used by one of the professors of uh, environmental sustainable forestry and it is for the students to come out and study these different tree species to recognize what they look like their morphology and uh, do other associated research with them. There's the keyhole garden I mentioned earlier. And so the rope and stakes immediately in the foreground here uh, looks possibly like a very small miniature cricket pitch. It's not at all. This is the boundary of our seven circuit classical labyrinth. It's nine meters in diameter, about 27 foot. And uh, in the next six weeks will be absolutely stunning because planted underneath we have over 4,000 bulbs of crocus vernus and so the wonderful mauves, um, whites and yellows of the crocus will come through framing the labyrinth design and shape. It takes about three minutes to walk into the middle. When it's not in flower we still mow it, it's still enjoyable year round but it was put in deliberately for fun and to rem as the bulbs come through to remind us of the long winter nights uh, disappearing and the gradual spring and summer days coming towards us. So spinning around you're going to see now um, part of our informal hedge. We have a number of hedges in the collection but this is very much an informal one. Parts of it have been laid, um, stems cut and laid down to then sprout up and it's full of British native species. It's a very d deliberate display. We've got um, uh, holly in here, we've got um, uh, rose, we have uh, hawthorn, blackthorn, there is uh, field maple among other species and from a ecological standpoint this would be referred to as a corridor allowing animals to move between different areas of vegetation and it is beautiful in its own right but it's also very successful as a um, planted area of biodiversity. Just as we pan along there, perhaps you're not getting um, key detail, but you're looking there at holly, uh, honeysuckle, as I mentioned, Lunisra there. You'll see some field maple ash in there as well, uh, field maple, Asa compestry. And gradually as we come to the end of this informal hedgerow, we'll be looking towards um, what we call the evolution beds. These, these uh, pair of beds have some conifers in that and and indeed ginkgos um, ginkgo biloba but some conifers that help tell the narrative the story of uh, conifers on this on this planet gradually evolving into broadleaf trees and then we'll pivot round to the right and you'll see again sadly dead our second camperdown elm it too um, two years ago died from dutch elm disease but it's in such a stately position now with a raised bed perfect sitting height as well put around the base but you can see some of that lovely contorted growth there it's unique it's beautiful and we're using that now as a framework for other plants to grow up and through so we put guy wires into that and we're beginning to plant climbers at the base it is my hope in the next three five years that the pendulous growth of the of the elm we lost will become pendulous of different climbers cascading down we're just again beginning to pivot around you're looking east back towards the Crookshank building now but this is known as the birch lawn it's what we dubbed the birch lawn it's got uh, about uh, six seven mature trees in there uh, birch fir larch um, a turkey oak quercus frenetto a stunning space and just standing in there whether the trees are in leaf or not you look up and it, it has a, a feeling of, of being in a cathedral type environment We are going to continue to walk in a westerly direction. You'll see that there are some um, shrubs to look at and trees as well in a, uh, in a moment. Um, looking here across to the 
birch lawn, as we call it, the, the conifer tree in front of you is a, um, a uh, Atlantic cedar, Cedrus atlantica. That'll look stunning in another uh, 60 to 80 years time. The building, the house you see in the far corner, there, that's in the southwest corner, we know it is the head gardener's house, and historically it was indeed where the head gardener resided. It's owned by the Crookshank Garden Trust, the original trust founded when Anne Crookshank gave the uh, seven original seven acres to the university in 1898. And, um, and while it's still run by the trust today, it's, uh, it's rented out and it's a pair of professionals, uh, professional couple who live there. I always say that whoever is in there renting has the best backyard in Aberdeen. Uh, again, we'll, the, the camera will pivot uh, uh, around a little bit and uh, you can see that we have some other trees there within the winter landscape. Tree work, shrub work is um, ongoing and certainly in the winter months, particularly when trees are semi-deciduous or deciduous, it's much easier to see their framework. In this case, you're seeing a shrub that is beginning to break from the base and so we're slowly reducing it and thinning it out. Uh, we talk about the three Ds plus C, dead, disease, damaged and crossing. And that's the, what we look for with uh, plants and shrubs during the winter months, particularly trying to uh, keep them healthy and, and improve air movement. You might have not noticed some chain link there off to the right. Other paths along on the right here have further chain link. It leads into the sunken garden. And with COVID-19, we had to leave site last summer. We lost four months of growing time and we just haven't had time to get back consciously into the sunken garden. It's presently uh, cordoned off uh, so that we can access it and get on with work gradually there, but not have uh, any concerns for the public walking into a space that isn't as safe as it as it needs to be. Well, we're looking due south into the only formal part of the Botanic Garden. You'll notice the formality, not just in design, but with the formal hedges on the left and the right. At the very far end is the boundary wall of uh, St. Macca Drive. And you're looking at a yet to be completed, but brand new, the most um, uh, new and, and significant new build on campus. This is the Science Hub as is named. And it's the new science building for the amalgamation of sciences to be taught in one location. So biological subjects will be taught there along with physics, chemistry, and geography and geophysics. Uh, just behind that and slightly off to the right, you can see the very iconic library. So uh, a new building framing the Rose Garden it's really rather fine. Formality of one being the formality of another. We will continue to move along this path to the very western edge in a moment. You'll see some beehives. I'll explain those in a second. I should just add with the rose garden there, the sunken area is where we have our herbal collection. Again, another pathway leading into the sunken garden. So we're now very much on the western fringe of the botanic collection. There are the beehives. When I first came here, there were no beehives in the collection. And that seemed a missed opportunity because in the zoology building, some of the cutting edge research that continues is to do with management of commercial beehives with um, the, the, uh, the honeybee populations um, that are so important um, in, in any commercial guys around the world. There is a mite that is very bad news if it gets into into beehives. It um, it dramatically reduces the health and the population of beehives, commercial beehives. The mites, Latin named, it says it all. It is Varroa destructor. That is its Latin name. So research being done here is to try and find ways to help honeybees um, combat this mite once it's in the collection. And uh, the hives you see here are for research use. But of course, if you're if you're part of the bee collective there, to be in a botanic garden is a joy. Birthday and Christmas wrapped up every day for them, I think, unless they're in the winter months as we see today. So along the western flank, we'll just pause here for in a, in a moment, and you'll be able to look down into the sunken garden. Nicole, if you can just carry on for a brief moment more, and um, I'll just explain briefly some of the. Uh, snowy features that you'll see in the lower section there. You once again might just be able to make in the in the foreground as you look down uh, more chain link. That is not to do with 
um, keeping people from an unsafe area. That uh, is a area we permanently cordon off because it's an area of lawn that we only formally cut once a year. It's it's really a meadow, uh, a very um, basic lawn meadow. But we try to reduce compaction walking across there because we have a wonderful array of spring and autumn bulbs that come through there in the springtime and this will be mid-April probably uh, this year. We will see among other species bulbs coming through the wonderful um, snake's head fritillaries and uh, Fritillaria meleagris uh, among others absolutely stunning in there and as I mentioned in autumn, autumn crocus among other plants. So it's, it's very picturesque just in that lawn space alone. I've mentioned tree management, it's, it's ongoing. We have inherited, my, my team and I, some magnificent trees from our predecessors. Uh, I'll say a bit more about that in a second, but along the western flank here, we've got some hollies. Uh, we're beginning to work on that and wish to replant along this western flank uh, and improve our, our holly collection, genus Ilex. You're looking there at the zoology building, um, an outstanding example of brutalism, if I might say so, uh, to the point where uh, later this week and over the weekend, there will be filming of a major film uh, happening on the far side of this building, on the Tilly Drone Avenue side. In fact, the road is being corned off. It's that sort of serious type of Hollywood filming. And apparently they've chosen the front of the zoology building because they wanted a, uh, to create a, a visual situation that looked like, so I am told, looked like East Germany before the wall came down. I don't think anything more need be said about the architectural prowess of the zoology building for such use. We're just coming up to probably the last major tree on the western flank here in the southern section of the garden. It's a sycamore. It's a very fine tree. But you'll notice that rather strange branch that over many decades has been allowed to grow out and twist around to the front searching for light. It's that sort of um, un unhelpful growth that we have inherited with certain trees, uh, creating joints that are potentially structurally unsound. And features like that will need to gradually be removed. And we are every year. Um, getting in a professional um, tree gang. Uh, they work across the green campus of the whole university and they assist greatly with mitigation uh, tree work where necessary. In the case of elms that we've lost over, over the years, they come in and formally fell those as well. Much of the wood is chipped. We use those chippings, we use that mulch to great benefit through the collection as well. Nicole, if we can just carry on. And so we have come to the western side, the ramp there leading into the zoology building. We're looking due east now, the main paved path. You'll remember at the start of this visual tour that that path was at the Crookshank building end. Well, you carry along and you're walking uh, parallel to the, as we're looking at it now, parallel to the sunken garden on your right and the uh, herbaceous border on your left. And the herbaceous border is one of the great beds and displays of this botanic garden. It's 87 meters long, that's um, some 200 foot. Um, uh, it's five meters wide, some 15 foot. It's a stunning collection of herbaceous plants and it's a double sided display. And what I mean by that is you can enjoy it down both sides. The stake and the netting over it, the netting allows the plants to grow up through and be maintain their own um, vertical stability without any further assistance historically and when I first came here it was very much a annual job of putting in canes and string and uh, metal wire loops it looked magnificent but a huge amount of effort required and if there's one policy I've brought to the botanic garden and collectively as a team we work towards uh, extending the areas within the garden to further our botanic collection while having less open beds to maintain. And part of that ethos is to have less seasonal work than is necessary. Putting up the netting has dramatically reduced the need for all the canes and the string, putting them out each spring, taking them in each autumn. And what's extraordinary now is you see the growth at, at ankle height, if not dormant as per herbaceous material, height of summer, come in June through to 
early September, and you could be walking down one side of the herbaceous border, a friend or colleague of yours down the other, and you would hear each other, but you would not see each other. The growth can exceed two meters in places. Just uh, focusing in on begonia here at the at the front of this bed. You'll see the label poking out of the snow in a second. You can see the netting there as well. Uh, begonia, sometimes known as elephant ears, an incredibly tough plant. Um, uh, there you go, begonia purpurescens is the Latin name there, purple leafed elephant ears. Um, I've successfully grown it in hot, dry summer Canadian temperatures. Uh, and here it is happily surviving sub-zero for a matter of days or weeks at 57 degrees north. Good plant, tough plant, often um, producing pink flowers. We're slowly spinning around here, the three uh, metal containers there. Uh, the one in the foreground has a fern, um, a species that naturally dies down, but the other two have tree ferns in them, Dicksonia antarctica, coming from New Zealand. Uh, tolerant of winter conditions, they'll be absolutely fine. And so we move through this beautiful ornate gate circa 1902, uh, a gate with uh, botanic motifs welded onto it, and we come into the central lawn and pond garden. Immediately looking left, there's normally snowdrops coming through there. Uh, today, they have come through the snow, they're visible, not for today's tour. But we look out onto a further winter landscape. The central lawn and pond garden was created as a formal rock garden, a, a collection of alpines throughout. Uh, and it would have been a magnificent display when first put in in the late 60s, throughout the 1970s, into the very early 1980s, the most magnificent project for my longest serving predecessor, Noel Pritchard and his team. But very sadly, uh, due to uh, funding cuts across universities in the early 1980s, no less apparent for the University of Aberdeen. So the original workforce of this botanic garden, which was eight full-time gardeners overnight, was cut to four. And that significant change resulted in certain areas of the garden having to be managed in a different manner. Alpines, if you're not aware, are a wonderful group of plants that have evolved around the world to either grow at high elevation or high altitude. Uh, by, by default, they grow slowly and uh, can easily be outcompeted if if they're not constantly maintained and cared for. As such, the rock garden collection here gradually disappeared. And uh, since arriving at the botanics, not wanting an audience to show up and think that we have a rock garden with alpines and disappointingly showing up to find we have the rocks but not the plants, uh, it is formally today renamed as the Central Lawn and Pond Garden. It's got a wonderful collection, we're adding to it, but today it's much more trees and shrubs than anything else. You're also looking in the in the foreground here at what appears to be a heavily walked um, path through the snow. This is a wonderful example of, of what we know every winter becomes clearly visible. In the distance, you'll see this soon uh, in, a, in a more um, formalized manner, we have our nursery. And uh, from the nursery, hot water pipes were put in running to the zoology building. And when they were laid well over 20 years ago, they were put at a depth that wasn't as deep as perhaps should have been. You can see that the residual heat comes up through the grass and melts any snow. A new path put through here along the north facing wall of the dividing wall. Camellias there in the foreground. But we now have some wonderful mature, particularly mature rhododendrons. Uh, some magnolias growing through here as well. The leaf, the bark of the stem, uh, stems of the trees, all at a um, at a height and size now that is just a delight to see. So paths put through here for people to see them up close and, and enjoy them accordingly. In this case, you're looking at rhododendron falcon falconeri. Um, and uh, you can see that wonderful peeling bark. It's a very fine plant with those large leaves and the, 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 the brown under fur on the base of the leaf as well. Nicole, if we just carry on. We will pivot in a moment around to our left once again. This path carries on, but we'll pivot around and we'll be looking at the bottom of the pond system that was put in, again, all part of the original design of my predecessors um, in the late 1960s. And there's five ponds. This is the, the, the major one at the bottom. And the water feature features allow cascading water to come to come down and through the, the sound and movement of water in any garden, of course, is always an added bonus. Uh, last year, 
the my team excuse me along with invaluable help from volunteers totally revamped this pond system took it back to its original design and in the process we've reduced the size of the beds on both sides again uh, adding to our collection but having less to manage overall but it's looking stunning and uh, it will continue to improve in the years to come we're beginning to move through in and, and look at some of the other plants within the central lawn and pond garden um, immediately in the foreground there was a conifer conifers were put in as part of the original rock garden design just to, to, to be at knee height and make you feel you're walking above the tree line here's another case in point this is um, Abies coriana the Korean fir produces beautiful dark blue cones but of course you leave a conifer like that for 40 years it's no longer at knee height and it becomes a stately plant in its own right but needle drop adds acidity to the soil below it does change the growth and nature looking skyward there to the wonderful trio of dawn redwoods i always say that if you're a scrabble player it's worthy to know the latin name of this plant either the genus or the species the specific epithet metasequoia glyptostriboides you put that on triple letter score you're gonna have an early night having one uh, one hands down but these are three stunning uh, dawn redwoods planted as a trio and they have that lovely stately shape a rare conifer in the sense that it is deciduous larch of course is another example of that looking through here there's uh, remnants of trunk and 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 um, base base of trunk of a huge elm again roughly 90 years old that had to be felled four years ago uh, there's always ongoing projects in the botanics in this case to have that major horizontal trunk split down the middle flipped and we'll have two major seats and benches and I hope in time to have a seasonal covered space there as well um, ongoing work to be done it sounds and looks easy it is actually an enormous piece of wood looking through to the glass house collection there we'll focus on that in a moment that's the behind the scenes nursery wonderful tri-stemmed roble beach here that's R R for roble roble beach north of Vegas obliqua a Chilean um, southern hemisphere beach very very beautiful they grow as single stem specimens what we think happened here is there is a new introduction to britain first brought in in 1903 and then probably within 10 years to this botanic garden the policy at the time was that if you had new species you didn't know how they would survive and you had more than one you would plant them uh, next to each other in the hope that if one failed the others would survive in this case we believe what happened was all three immediately responded took root well and in time fused together they are very beautiful and approximately um oh a good 20 meters a good 60 meters 60 foot if not more in height they're very very fine we have a single stem specimen in the arboretum and you can just see the network of of uh, of tree limbs up there we have over the last eight years taken off 10 meters off one of those three stems for, for structural stability monkey puzzle here utterly unique in its in its silhouette uh, quite why in Britain there's a penchant to plant them invariably within 20 foot of your front door or front window if you have a, a front garden I will never know look at that size come the time it's easier to move your house than it is a tree of such maturity but they're very beautiful the dark silhouette in the background there is of a Mediterranean oak uh, Quercus ilex the home oak probably the best example of the northeast here in the botanic garden which is, is very fine moving up into the top section here of the central lawn and pond garden um, some of you might remember you'll see a moment in a moment where it was that there was a scree bed again another feature of a rock garden we took that out earlier this year wonderful mature native birch there um, betula uh, pubescent and uh, um, it's reaching maturity at some point we will um, lose it tragically and so the tree you see immediately in the foreground here is our um, future proofing quote unquote forward planning it is a tulip tree of the east coast of north america liriodendron tulipifera and of course to plant now uh, to give time for new growth to replace um, a plant of of maturity in time is appropriate and quite quite rightly part of of, of our botanic garden management however it's only so clever as making sure that a, one of the huge limbs of that birch doesn't come crashing down on top of it in future years let us hope that does not happen um, I said pubescence it's not pubescent sorry it's betula pendula 
looking there, that's where the scree bed was in the foreground of those rocks. It's all, all lawn now, again, an area we removed because we didn't have the ability to maintain the remnants of alpine in there. There's your monkey puzzle once again. As I said, such a distinct silhouette. We'll move back down the slope. We're going to uh, pivot right in a moment and just look at the compost area and brash pile. We have our own chipper shredder, so we'll once again be chipping that in due course. There are, we are due major developments to improve the nursery area off to the right and have formalized bays for the compost area, uh, have a formal concrete base, reinforced concrete base. Uh, all of that is being priced up as we speak. Right now, this entrance allows uh, wheelchair and buggy users from the southern section into the central lawn and pond garden. In due course, there'll be a ramp through that lovely ornate gate at the western end, allowing people to access the central lawn and pond garden with this area being formally cordoned off for our use, machinery, what have you. There's the brash pile. And again, in the background, the Crookshank building, just to give you a feeling of orientation. The hedge here is is more formal than informal. It's hornbeam, um, and you, it, when in leaf, looks very similar, perhaps to uh, beech. Uh, in winter time, a beech hedge versus a hornbeam hedge is is an uh, easy, easily distinguishable. The beech hedge keeps its brown leaves on, the hornbeam does not. As you can see there, it's, it's utterly deciduous. So we're looking down the main path now of our nursery area. You can see a lot of our um, tree and shrub stock lined out in pots, predominantly on the right. The greenhouse immediately in the foreground on your left is our propagation house. And that is now being maintained by our garden apprentice. Uh, Leslie is in year two or four, and she is maintaining the propagation house to an incredibly high standard. She has taken um, that charge on magnificently and is really becoming exceedingly proficient in growing indoor plants and propagating at the same time. Uh, I have not seen the prop house look better since I've been here, very encouraging. You'll, you can also see our polytunnel immediately off uh, in the mid ground there off to the, off to the left. Uh, there's the curved hornbeam hedge as mentioned and our pots laid out. A snow, in, snow environment does show off the broad shapes of any environment particularly well. One of the greenhouses there, that middle greenhouse, one of two, is part of the School of Biological Sciences research area. Polytunnel belongs to us. You're seeing that immediately on your left. And in a moment, you'll see another greenhouse, as mentioned uh, on the left. That's for plant and soil science. At the moment, a PhD student is doing major research in there, uh, looking at the growth of um, different species in soil mixes of the northeast and that kind of work um, I think Rosie has another 18 months to 24 to to complete her doctorate you're looking here again at a relatively new installment this is a fairly major uh, weather station and we do receive the data not directly we we have it sent to us from the PhD student who is using it as part of his formal research uh, it's wonderful that we are having academic uh, particularly postgraduates, but long-term research being done in the gardens using the uh, living collection and the resources available. In this case, Jamie's um, into his second year of this research and in the Arboretum has probes going into a number of trees where he is monitoring uh, water flow. Ultimately, his research is looking at how plants uh, carry water from the heavens through leaf and stem down trunks and or once it's hit open ground being taken up through the root mass the root systems and through evapotration evapotranspiration moving um, back up through the plant and being released um, by the the stomata of the plants into the atmosphere and that whole water cycle ultimately is research that he'll be able to overlay into urban environments looking at long-term water management and the purpose and importance of plants in, in an urban environment to mitigate potential future flooding in any part of the world. Uh, very important, very engaging research. That large flat space in front of you, all part of our nursery, under there is lawn. We grow our own turf. Uh, where there is wear and tear throughout the botanic gardens, rather than buying it in, we grow our own, and that's what you're seeing there. Uh, the Anderson hut there, historic building in, in shape and, and design. It's 
or our machinery, a smaller brick, what we call the hen house there, another storage area. And then these open bays with the Harris fencing on them, uh, the one on the left is this past autumn's leaves all collected up, rotting down there. The middle bay is the leaves of 2019. And so the third year, um, fully rotted down, referred to as leaf mold, absolutely invaluable to us. And we use that to make our own potting composts. Uh, you've seen a lot of the pots lying, lying out a moment ago, open ground, while they are all made with potting compost stuff. Our mix uh, topsoil pile there as well. The reason we can grow it all outside, uh, sorry, store all of that outside is we have a soil steriliser. So any weed seed that has blown in, we kill off before we turn it into a into a potting mix. Uh, coming around the corner here, again, part of the Carpinus hedge, you'll also see this, this very tall dead trunk. It too is an elm tree and it's, uh, it's not the most sightly of sentinels, but it is there. Uh, we have taken off all that we can legally take off that came over our property. It does not belong to us. It is our neighbor's tree and uh, they have left it standing. Uh, as it's slowly rotting away, I sincerely hope it doesn't come crashing down on our side, but as it's slowly rotting away, so it's providing habitat for many other uh, species of, of both bird and insect. And regularly at the top, we have birds perching, including woodpeckers coming through, uh, which is, is lovely. Other side of the nursery there, uh, sorry, compost area of the nursery, which will be developed as indicated. And so we come back out into the southern section of the garden. We're back on the paved path. We're now at the eastern end of the herbaceous border. The brick wall in the foreground there is the patio. And that patio in weather like this is, is fairly lethal. It's um, flagged with red sandstone from Dumfries and Galloway. Beautiful stone, but very slippery in these conditions. But because we're looking west here. It does mean that this wall is facing due solar south, the patio itself being a wonderful sun trap, regularly used by students and staff on sunny days. But from a botanic collection standpoint, gives us a microclimate to grow certain plants in there that uh, just wouldn't easily succeed elsewhere in the gardens. One of the plants being Melianthus madra, a wonderful um, broad, light green leafed. Um, I think it's probably probably safe to call it herbaceous plant of South Africa and um, not typical at this latitude to be growing year round outside but it survives because of that microclimate. We lack a number of things at the Botanic Garden. One of them is covered space. You see there our only covered space, the so-called summer house um, and it is large enough to like take four people if you like each other and just about two in our present conditions of social distancing of two meters. It would be wonderful to have improved covered space and perhaps in the future that will be possible. You're seeing the stakes once again and, and, and the netting of the herbaceous border there looking through to other uh, plants in our collection. The azalea beds in the foreground there, wonderful array of bold colours in May when they come into full flower. And so we're coming to the end of the tour at this stage in a moment. You'll be able to see yours truly all bundled up as I was in winter gear for this tour. And so we we finish with my face. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Mark. Just popping my video on. Or, yes, there we go. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. It was, I think for many of us, you obviously can't be in the gardens. Um, it's lovely to kind of get an insight, especially I think when it's covered in snow, it's quite a special time to see them like that. Um, so thank you very, very much. Thank you for filming. Thank you for taking us on the tour. Um, so oh, now if anyone has any questions, um, we did get one uh, during the talk. Um, so if you have any questions, if you just pop them in the chat feature um, and I can read them out for you. So we'll begin with one from uh, John, uh, who asked initially, um, is there still a notion of opening up a new gate entrance to the garden from St. Marker Drive? Aha, uh -huh. that is a lovely question. Um, no. <laughs> <laughs> no is the is the very succinct answer and it's very rare that you get a straight no or yes from me sadly i don't think that will 
will happen. Um, when I first came to the gardens, it was uh, a unique opportunity that there was some money made available and planning permission was pursued. But uh, tragically, for a variety of reasons, it wasn't able to be um, taken forward in large part and I won't go into great detail now, but in large part because there was extensive conversations about the age of the St. Macca wall. You see, saw a portion of it as we were looking south through the Rose Garden on the tour today. And um, uh, from you'll be aware that the campus and therefore the Botanic Garden falls within conservation heritage status. And the, um, the, the definition of the wall being ancient uh, was a significant player in in why um, sadly that that did not materialize uh, the entry it the botanic garden is is a unique resource i made that very clear but it's also unique with regards to where it is in the context of the campus it's wonderful to have it within the northern heart of the campus. Um, for instance, Liverpool Botanic Garden is 12 miles out from main campus. That would be so much more difficult to um, encourage students and staff to use. Uh, but the, the downside in the context of this Botanic Garden is that we don't have a glamorous formal entrance. If you come through the formal entrance as we know it off the Channery, you're met by the corner of the Crookshank building and it, it takes um, it takes a little bit of determination and, and curiosity to walk around the side of that building before you get into the courtyard. The courtyard of the Crookshank building, I think you'll agree, is um, a little more glamorous than the, the zoology building, but that, that's not um, great praise for either building and or space. And certainly since I've been curator, I have, um, which was out of my control, I've had a large gray um, metal cage installed that holds an argon tank. Now that tank is is absolutely purposeful for, for plantar science research, nothing wrong with that. But I think it's safe to say I'm the only curator in the world to have a steel cage as part of my opening foreground when you come and visit a botanic garden. So uh, there are challenges. It would be lovely to have, have those gates resurrected in some guise or, a, or an entrance improved in some manner, sadly not at the moment. Thank you. We've got lots of messages saying thank you so much uh, for the tour. Um, very enjoyable. Okay. Obviously, people are joining us from different parts of the country and the world. Uh, so it's nice for them to be able to get an insight into the gardens. Um, I can see uh, Nicole's answered John's question, but I guess just to say for everyone, we are doing a spring walk as well. So that will be um, in April. So Nicole's popped a link to uh, the event so that you can register if you'd like to see the garden in spring, um, which I'm sure will be very different to when we've seen them covered in snow. Um, if you have any other questions, like I said, feel free to pop them in the chat. There's fewer messages of thanks coming in uh, thanks from Perth. Thanks from the south of England. <laughs> as as uh, as has just been mentioned, um, we will be doing another virtual tour in a couple months' time. Uh, let us hope. No, no predicting of anything. Let us hope that that is not under snow. But we just don't know. Um, for those of you who know Aberdeen well or remember it well, from a growing standpoint, we can get frosts in in early May. Uh, and there is certainly a suggestion that the sun and warmth of, of this week now is not going to last and we're going back to a bit of cold, a prolonged cold perhaps for next, uh, next week and, and weeks thereafter. So let us hope we can show you the botanics next time in, in well, with more greenery and less white. <laughs> Um, we've had another question from Anne, um, who's asking, are there any um, other environmentally interesting parts of the university campus? Environmentally interesting? Uh, what a fascinating question. Um, of course, I answered that by immediately saying one person's interest is another person's um, less interest. <laughs> if I can say that. But uh, from an environmental standpoint, uh, yes, I think I think there's certainly two two areas I would highlight. One is the green campus as a whole. There are some very good trees planted throughout the campus. And in today's tour, you noticed that I had to highlight with, with great sadness two mature Camperdown elms that have 
succumbed to Dutch elm disease and been felled. There is a considerably younger plant that is in um, quite near the, the arts um, um, lecture hall. There's a young Camperdown elm, uh, which so far has not been hit by the, the Dutch elm disease by, by the beetle itself. That's very encouraging. So we still have some, some very fine trees on campus and uh, my opposite team, the grounds team and my opposite um, number, Bruce Reed, uh, manager of the grounds team, an ex arboriculturalist, ex horticulturalist himself, is passionate about improving the, the tree collection across campus. So that's certainly very good news. We also have in recent years had green roofs put into some of our buildings, not least with the library. And while they may not have grown as was perhaps originally planned by maintaining the species diversity first put in, what has happened is that the species that can survive the growing conditions are doing very well and they are being supplemented now. And so that is adding an element of biodiversity at the same time. Thank you. Um... The next one is, what is your favourite part of the garden in winter? Well, that's a very clever question. It's the in winter bit that allows me to narrow it down. <sighs> My favourite bit in the winter. I think, I think I'm going to be a little unkind and answer that by saying there's three areas because winter for me is November through to March. So I get four months to, to, to argue with. Um, in November and late December in the central lawn and pond area, we have a species of snowdrop. It is a Greek mountain snowdrop and it flowers before Christmas. So you could say you're seeing your first snowdrops of the season or the last of the year. It depends how you look at things. Uh, so that's rather special. Lovely to have that um, as a botanic collection, wholly appropriate and, and rightly so that we have plants in year. Uh, sorry, in flower year round. And so there may not always be many at certain times of the year, but they're always there. So that's very special. Uh, in January, as we come back a little late this year, not by much, maybe two or three weeks, but a little later than usual, we have our um, our, our um, witch hazels, the hammer malice. Uh, we've got a variety of species or cultivar on site. We want to bulk that up in time. But to have those wonderful yellow uh, crinkled petals coming through is very special. And then um, Overall, I think the second section of the garden I took you through today, the Central Lawn and Pond Garden, is just lovely when there is snow on the ground because there are so many shapes and forms there, plus, of course, the water. It's a very engaging space. You never get tired of going in there in such an environment. You always see something new. Thank you. I'm just reading some of the comments as well. Just more messages of thank you, which is very nice. Um, and Susan's asking, are you able to instigate research or must it come from the academic departments? Well, again, you're all asking superb questions. Thank you so much. I shouldn't say that in a surprise tone. It's a delight. Um, again, it's a, it's a very interesting question. I just do not have the time personally to instigate my own research. But as a garden team, we do do some research, even if we don't formally wrap it up in an academic context. So our research is very much in the growing of our collection, seeing how they um, uh, succeed. One of the issues I haven't touched upon today, and maybe it's a conversation for all, more formally for the next the next video tour, but pest and disease, uh, referred to as PND, is is a major issue, and with climate change becoming all the more so. So part of our our research is very much a behind the scenes, um, leading up on pest and disease that is coming into Britain or, or or here in the northeast now, but also then looking at the health of our plant collection and trying to at times establish what is. Um, weakening a plant or, or tragically sometimes killing them off. We we have um, a case in point leading into the Arboretum where knowing that we've got fire blight in the collection, this is a disease that specifically kills woody plants of the rose family. So ironically, not generally roses, but uh, plants such as um, um, rowans, um, uh, hawthorns, uh, cotoneaster, photinia, um, 
apples, pears, the list goes on. We have um, hawthorn and sorbus um, rowans growing together. The rowans on, in this one area are doing incredibly badly. We think it's fire blight, but if it is, why are the um, hawthorn of an identical family growing at the bottom where the roots are probably interconnected, also not showing any signs of stress? So it's that sort of research we're involved with. As for um, the other type of research, that which is more formal with undergraduates or postgraduates, I'm passionate to have the garden used more and more. And so I am constantly um, approaching both students and staff saying, don't hesitate to come and use the garden. And there are some staff who do consistently year on year. COVID-19 and the restriction on field trips has, has augmented that, uh, which I'm delighted with for the time being. I get a lot of interest from, from academics from other disciplines across the university. After all, a botanic garden, particularly a botanic garden, is where the arts and sciences meet, how appropriate for a university that is inherently of arts and science combined. So it's something that I'm always pursuing and, and trying to perpetuate. Thank you. We've had a, a suggestion from June uh, in the past that you've done um, talks on the herbal uses of items in the garden. So that might be something for us to consider uh, as another future talk. <laughs> uh, we love, uh, getting some suggestions and comments about what we can do, so that's great. Um, yep, I'm delighted with all of those. We'll go through them afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've got one saying, uh, why was your position not filled in the 25 years prior to you starting and who looked after the garden during that time? Well, I can see everyone with these questions that you don't really want lunch and don't want tea. Well, well you know, you might get dinner at this rate. Um, uh, it's a, again, a, a very appropriate question. Um, it reflects in part on, on what I was answering a moment ago about research. Botanic gardens have in Europe had a, a fascinating history. The oldest is in is 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 at Padua in Italy, uh, founded in the 16th century. The um, oldest botanic garden in Britain is Oxford University Botanic Garden, uh, very quickly followed in 1673 by the Chelsea Physic Garden, still still there, that wonderful three and a half acre in the heart of London at Chelsea itself, Royal Hospital Road. Uh, and the role and use of of Western Botanic Gardens from the continent moving into this country historically was for the growing and study of plants for medicine. And um, gradually that focus changed and some of the great botanic gardens of the UK, Kew and Edinburgh are the two classics, um, were able to expand and become jewels in the crown, both in the south and north of Britain. And with that, train up significant plant hunters to go around the world and bring eminent material back. Research uh, continued from that. And um, botanic gardens of that stature continue to do such, such good work to this day. But along the way, conservation became uh, very important and is still a, a, a vital role. And the expansion of research from, from medicine to the teaching of botany as a formal discipline uh, evolved and to a certain extent horticulture as well. So horticultural gardening, I use both terms synonymously, are the, 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 the training and growing of plants, botany, the, the scientific study of those grown plants. What is tragic in this country is that you can no longer get an undergraduate degree in botany. It does not exist in terminology. What does exist are in limited locations around Britain now, uh, degrees in plant science. And there is one university in Britain to offer a joint undergraduate degree in plant and soil science. And considering that most of the plants as humans we use are terrestrial, what I mean by that is they grow on land, they grow in soil, how appropriate to have a dual degree of that, of that discipline. It so happens that it's the University of Aberdeen that offers that low soul degree. But to call a degree plant science and not botany is not just pedantic with change of terminology, it matters. And by not teaching botany so formally, so other core disciplines are not taught to any great degree, any more, sorry, any great um, level of, of, of in-depth study. Uh, and that includes taxonomy, nomenclature, systematics. I'm sitting here in the herbarium. We have a wonderful herbarium. We're so fortunate at the university to have one, but it too is tragically underused. And 
uh, there's no better resource when it comes to learning your your plants of the world and studying them um, uh, in a in a pressed format. All of this led, I, um, as I understand it, uh, to the late 1990s, uh, with um, late 80s. Sorry, um, uh, late 80s led to the role of the botanic garden not being as prevalent as it as it once was in the teaching of botany. It was the living collection for students to um, use. And with that, so the emphasis of the garden changed. And while it was still recognized as a beautiful space, an important green space, I don't think it maintained uh, or was seen to maintain the scientific edge and purpose that it had originally um, been, been um, bequeathed for. So wonderful that Professor Sian Diamond um, and Ian Alexander, when he retired as Regis Keeper of, of um, of the botanic gardens as he retired was able to emphasize that if it was to be maintained and improved then a curator post the, the curatorship should be reinstated i'm delighted to be the one great we've just got like a couple more i think one of them is quite a good one to sort of end on um so someone's asking um if you've got any idea of when the the gardens will be open to the public again and um yes. the other one that i think is a good one to end on is what's the main 2021 project for the gardens. Oh my goodness! No, you, you, none of you want lunch or tea. I can tell. Um, uh, to those of you asking when the BG will be open again, uh, I would love to tell you tomorrow, and that will not be the case. I do not know, and it is dependent on the rules and regulations within uh, coming from the Scottish government with regards to COVID-19, and then the university acting um, on those rules and regulations. At the moment, um, the the um, university has core key workers on site to maintain the campus at operational readiness, and we, as the professional gardening team, are classed as core workers in that context. There are no other staff on campus who can maintain the living collection, and just as you have staff maintaining um, uh, some of the uh, research animals on site, the aquariums, for instance. So it's vital that we're able to maintain our collection and to keep it at quote unquote operational readiness so that when we can reopen, there won't be a two to three month delay as there was late last year, having needed to leave um, due to the pandemic. So I can't tell you when it will open, but I, I hope that we can open it with minimal delay when we're given the green light even though April will be a virtual tour, wouldn't it be lovely to think that you, if you're local enough, you can come along the next day and enjoy it in, 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 in 3D. I can't promise that, I'm sorry, but um, I, I, I know Chloe and Nicole will be able to keep you informed uh, as and when that happens through, through um, alumni news. Uh, and what was the last lovely question? Um, what is the kind of projects for 20, the main oh, project yes. for 2021? The, the, the project. <laughs> There's always more than one. Uh, and there needs to be more than one. And the reason for that is is twofold. Uh, there's so much to do still. What a, what a treat to be involved with a, such a dynamic and engaging resource and having such a wonderful garden team who are equally passionate. And I should add, we have no volunteers on site at the moment because of COVID-19, but we, we do have volunteers, both students and, and, and um, other uh, volunteers on the outside of the university who, who wish to return. They're chomping at the bit. It'll be lovely to have them back. But um, Having more than one project is vital, partly because we need flexibility. And, and if we can't do project one, maybe we can deviate to, back to project two, partly because we're always, this is part of being a gardener, we're always working at the behest of the weather. You've seen today's tour. Um, we haven't put a spade in the ground in recent weeks. Uh, we've had frost or we've had snow. Um, so some of the projects have, have, have paused as well, but we will return to them. So for 2021, well, we sincerely hope, and, and this is a is 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 a contracting job, but we sincerely hope that we will have our nursery uh, compost area properly revamped, formal gates put in the nursery area, cord coordinated off in a safe manner, and and that will be 
Wonderful. The Sunken Garden, I mentioned it, you've seen it on tour today, cordoned off. Well, we have ongoing plans in there. And those plans, again, playing to our strengths. Uh, Predecessors dug down, they got close to the water table. Water table, we want to dig down further and create a natural pond in there. We think that will be another uh, beautiful new feature. We want to extend uh, our bulb collection there with the, the informal lawn. Uh, I'm hoping that we can do work on the peat beds. Um, uh, I think it is unnecessary to have, and they were put in predominantly, I think, for teaching purposes decades ago, but we have innately an acidic soil here in the Botanic Garden. I don't think it's necessary, therefore, to have beds just deliberately showcasing plants that like acidic conditions. The whole collection is proof of that. So hopefully we can make some improvements there as well. Um, ongoing tree work, the list goes on. Well, thank you again so much, not just for the tour, but for taking the time to kind of answer all of the questions that we've had. And thank you so much to everyone that's joined us this afternoon. Um, and like I said, hopefully we'll see you again um, at our spring walk, uh, virtual again. Um, and Nicole, pop the, the link in so that you can sign up to that there. So thanks again and enjoy um, the rest of your day or evening or morning, wherever you're joining us from. <laughs> Chloe, Nicole, thank you both as well for making this possible. Many thanks. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you.